lecture number 12 is Dhamma Group 7, Sunday 28 April 2024. Today we will be covering these three Dhamma topics, the seven, the seven. Again, it's Group 7, right? Seven Aparihaniya Dhamma, which you may have heard about it. And second, the seven virtue of a good man, Sapurisa Dhamma. Sapa means great or saint. Purisa, Purisa means man or person. So the Dhamma of a good person, the Dhamma of a virtuous man or a true person, there are many terms that use in English. Following by the seven factors of enlightenment, or Pochankha, Pochankha, this is maybe new to many of us. Uh, we're getting uh, to know more about the Pothipakhyatam. What is Pothipakhyatam? I will explain later uh, in this session. But we're getting to know some of them. Okay, you have been learning about the Itipata. We'll be learning about the five power. We learn uh, the Indriya. But today we're going to add on another group of Dhamma, which is composed of the seven of them, called the Pochankha. And that's called the seven factor of enlightenment. Okay, so get excited about it. Okay, so let's start from the first one. The Aparihaniya Dhamma. Aparihaniya Dhamma. Aparihaniya Dhamma means one without failure or deteriorate. So there are many places that the Buddha talk about this Dhamma. Today I will capture two of them, the one that the Buddha teach the monk, this one, and the one that the Buddha teach the lay people, which is another well-known sutra when it comes to uh, the teaching that teach the lay people how to live in peace, how to uh, secure the, the nation and the communities and the growth of the communities. The first one is the teaching that the Buddha gave specifically to the monks in this Ankhutra Nikaya 7.21, Arihaniya Dhamma. And there are, again, seven of them. The second teaching also contains seven factors as well, but slightly different. Today, we explore both of them. So you can, whether you're a monk, you get to know what the Buddha teach monk. If you're a lay person, you get to know the Buddha, how the Buddha teach the lay person. Okay, in this uh, same topic of the Dhamma, which is Aparihaniya Dhamma. And you can also find this teaching in the Mahaparinipana Sutra as well. In fact, many teachings of the Buddha, many, many important teachings of the Buddha kept in the last teaching, which is Mahaparinipana Sutta. Uh, it's considered to be the longest teaching of the Buddha that exists in the Buddhist text. I believe many of you are familiar with Dhammajakapavatana Sutra, right? The first teaching. And this is the last teaching before the Buddha entered Nibbana or pass away. Is called Mahaparinipana Sutra. These two sutra also have a unique uh, characteristic. The first teaching, the experience of the Nibbana or realization of liberation is, is just fresh, very fresh. So after seven weeks of reflect on his achievements, so he shared everything that he discovered, not everything, the essence of the teaching of his discovery to the five aesthetic. So the first teaching is rich by a lot of Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist principle in the first teaching. But after spent 45 years travel throughout India, so he accumulates all kind of experience of teaching people, teaching the king, teaching the Brahmin, teaching the monks, teaching aesthetics, teaching the Bekka, with all of his teaching experience in that 45 years summarized into the last teaching. That's why it is the longest teaching that's appear in the Buddhist text, Mahaparinipana Sutra. So I, I strongly recommend you to find time to study the first one, the Dhammajak, and the second one, the Mahaparinipana Sutra. They have uh, many, many beautiful stories uh, that appear in the last teaching of the Buddha. I just captured this one from the teaching that the Buddha gave to the lay people in the uh, Vesali, to the Wachian people, because this city of the Vesali had never been defeated to any army that exists during that time. And many kings, many leaders want to take over the Vesali. So they didn't know how come the Vesali city was so strong. And no one can destroy them. And this is because they follow this teaching. So no one can destroy the unity of their communities. There is no way that what cheese can be overcome by any war of the Rajan Achasatu. Achasatu is one of the kings who want to take over the Vesali uh, capital, but he cannot do it. Other than by persuasion, other than by internal discord, 
Okay, let's give us some hint, right? Either persuasion, persuade them. Okay, give up, you know, you get this and that benefit in return, then there's no war. If you want to fight with them, you cannot fight with the army of the Vesali. Uh, or you break them up, internal discord. If this happens, then the army of Vesali will be weakened. The power will be weakened and weakened. Then perhaps you can take over the capital of Vesali. That's how the sutra gets started. But before I carry on, I just want to stop here just a moment to help you recap what we learned. Today we are going to learn the Aparihaniya Dhamma, right? The virtue of the one that uh, without failing, without deteriorate. If you have this Dhamma, you cannot fail. It's a non-decline. But we did learn several teachings that refer to all the concept of the non-decline. We learned the six kinds of respect, six kinds of reverence, six kinds of esteem, right? The reverence of the Buddha, the reverence of the Dhamma, the reverence of the Sangha. We also know that there is the reverence or the respect of the training or the education, the respect of heedfulness, which again refers specifically to the word mindfulness or sati, and the reverence of hospitalities. So we did learn that, okay, if you follow six of these, you put into practice, you cannot fail. The reason you cannot fail, you should know by now, right? Because you have uh, faith to your teacher, faith with the teaching, faith with the sangha, faith with the Buddha, right? And you also have faith with the training. You mean you continue to learn, study, you know, develop yourself. You practice yourself uh, to be mindful and aware of what's going on. And you also welcome people who you know, come to your place, the community, uh, in your community. But today, the Buddha gave the teaching to different group of people under the same name, but different situation, different context. And he go deeper. Okay? Now we're going to see the seven kinds of Apariha, Niya Dhamma, not just six of them. But some of them here on the screen will appear, okay, will appear in that seven factor as well. So uh, you should pay close attention and to see if you can connect the dot and most importantly, be able to put them into practice. Start from the first group. This is the one that the Buddha mentioned to the monk, okay. The seven dhamma, seven factor that lead to non-decline and only to the development and growth or gain to the sangha, specifically to the sangha or the monk or the monastic communities. There are seven of them. So I'm just going to read through this quickly and I'm, I'm going to explain one by one in a moment. To hold regular and frequent meeting, that's number one. To meet together in harmony, disperse in harmony and to do business and duty of the Sangha in harmony. To introduce non-revolutionary ordinance, break up no established ordinance, no established, okay? But train oneself according with the prescribed training rules. Number four, to honor and respect those elders of long experience, the fathers, the leaders of the orders, order means Sangha, monastic communities, and deems them worthy of listening to. And number five, not fall under the influence of craving. And number six, to delight in forest retreat. And number seven, the last one, to establish oneself in mindfulness, thinking that let the disciplines call celibate who have not come, come, um, come here and let those that have already come live in comfort. Okay. After go through this quickly, maybe some of them you can catch. Maybe some of them it doesn't make sense. Again, keep in mind this one the Buddha gave to the monk. Gave to the monk. And some of them the Buddha will give to the lay people. I will highlight it in a moment. So let's start from number one. So you know the difference between monk and the lay people, right? I keep emphasizing this from time to time. A monk is a man who ordained because he sees the drawback in the lay life. Living lay life is the path of dust. It's difficult to practice religious life in a purely perfect as a lay person. That's why people leave everything behind, say goodbye to the sin pleasure realm, sin pleasure world, the world of sense pleasure, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching. Then happy, right? So he turned his back to that realm and get himself ordained to pursue the refined form of happiness through meditation to the jhana and hopefully to achieve liberation one day down the road 
and that's the monk. So the teaching when the Buddha gave to the monk, just get to the point. If you follow this, you will get there fast. Okay, but for the lay people, people who still enjoy living life as a father, a husband, you know, owning the company, traveling the world, it's okay. You can do whatever will make you happy. But if you're following the Dhamma, put the Dhamma into practice correctly and properly, according to who you are and what you do, you can be happy too. And that's the beauty of the teaching of the Buddha. You don't have to be a monk to be happy. You can be happy of yourself, whoever you are, with the Dhamma that you practice, okay? A man without the Dhamma cannot find happiness, okay? Whoever you are, whether you're a monk or the lay person, it's just impossible. Start from number one. Always gathering together, gathering together through regular meetings and will attend it. Okay, this makes sense, right? This makes sense. If the group of people that we live with, that we work with, if we meet with each other often, with e we eagerly want to meet regularly, when it's time for the meeting, we want to show up. We want to share. We want to listen what's going on. I want to be a part. I have developed a sense of belonging. This organization belongs to me. I want to know what's going on. I want to participate. I want to help. So whenever meeting is, is, uh, is appointed, everyone feels like I want to be there. How many times you feel like you don't want to join the meeting? When you hear the word meeting, you say, oh, you know what? <laughs> just want to do something else, right? It's quite boring. There's something wrong with that meeting. But in the Sangha, the Buddha suggests that you guys, you should meet often. You should meet often. If you love each other, if you care about each other's well-being, you must show up for the meeting. Do not neglect the meeting. As a routine, by default, Buddhist monk, we usually meet four times a day already. When? First, morning chanting. The monk goes chanting. If you ordain, you follow the monk's activity. Get up 4.30, 5 o'clock, you show up for the, meet, uh, for the morning chanting. And then monk meditate together and then go arms round and then breakfast. So first meeting start at 5 o'clock. You show up. If someone don't show up, something is wrong with that monk. Whether he is sick, whether he is lazy, something is wrong. First day, okay. Second day, third day, one week, he still not show up. That gives us the signal is something wrong is happened in your organization, in your staff. Why he doesn't want to show up for the chanting, right? So morning chanting, breakfast, second time meeting, lunch, the third time for the meeting, and uh, evening chanting. You see, monk, we meet four times a day, at least four times a day. We can call it informal meeting, but we meet regularly. If you are a family, uh, uh, if you live life as a family man, husband and wife and children, when was the last time you have breakfast together? When was the last time you guys have dinner together? When was the last? When was the last time you guys actually sit down and talk together, happily, joyfully? If you don't remember when, something is wrong. Why you guys don't want to meet? Okay, if it's physical limitation, let's say you're in different country, and that's understandable. But you can meet online, right? You can be on the phone. But in general, if you feel that like, I don't want to meet with this person, I don't want to show up at the dining table, I don't want to see my father, that's the signal. That's the signal, okay? So we, how can we have harmony and unity if we don't want to meet with each other? So start from this one, the, the meeting regularly. And, and not just the meeting there. Feel like I want to join the meeting. I am a part of this group. I want to know what's going on. Okay? And the second thing, Buddha said, attending the meeting in unison. You see how clever of the Buddha. He talked about something like this almost 3,000 years ago. You can apply this into the business world, into any form of working, any form of lifestyle, any form of group that you belong. Okay? This brings harmony, uh, unity to the group that you belong to. Attending the meeting in unison and leaving, not just attending, leaving together at the end of the meeting and performing the prop, uh, uh, proposed work, the proposed work of the meeting together. Okay, what do you see here? We start the meeting. If the meeting starts at 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock, everyone should be there before 8 o'clock, not just 8 or 5. This I learned a lot about time, okay? In our community, I always, you know, suggest to our brothers here that 
we work with international people. Being on time is not enough. We have to be there before time of the meeting or the appointment. If the meeting starts at eight, at least 10 minutes, we should be there ready. Right? Sometimes the microphone doesn't working. Sometimes the air conditioning doesn't working. Sometimes the projector doesn't working. So we have time to figure it out and make sure everything okay when the time of the meeting will be started. So start together. Everyone, what if everyone show up eight o'clock? Then the meeting is powerful, right? The meeting is the meeting is ready. What is on agenda? Just go for it. Agenda one, agenda two, agenda three, all the way until finish. But if the boss come like eight fifteen or eight thirty, employee just sit there. They don't know what to do. They cannot make decision, right? So everyone is important. Every opinion is also important. So start together at eight and finish together at ten. Finish together at ten. Do your best if you lead the meeting. Do your best to finish on time, not too long. Get to the point. And I have many impressive experience to join the meeting with the senior monks in my organization. And one of the monks that I always admire, if I know he is the one who lead the meeting, I'm happy to be there. Not only I will learn a lot of how he think in the meeting, but I know he will get to the point and finish on time. Never delay, never ask, how are you doing? How is your mom and dad doing? We can talk about this later on outside the meeting. But when everyone in the meeting, time is valuable. right? Everyone dedicate the most valuable thing of their life into that meeting. But if we spend time on something else, how is you know your family doing? How is your business doing? That's going to take a lot of time to greet everyone like that. So start together, finish together. And not just that, you take the meeting seriously. Whatever uh, come out of the meeting, the summary of the work, the summary of the project. Okay, you guys do this, three of you do that, four of you do this. You implement it right away. Don't just procrastinate. Don't just put it on the folder. And I'll do it later. Meeting often and you know, do well in the meeting. Attending, start on time, finish on time, and uh, following the task at hand that need to be done after the meeting. And the third one, this one also interesting. The text says, the Buddha gave this teaching to the monk, right? He said, if the thing that uh, the monk should not remove or delete the rule that laid out by the Buddha and should not add on the new rules that did not issue by the Buddha. That's why Buddhism lasts for almost 3,000 years and it will continue to last because no one allowed to delete or remove or to adapt the teaching of the Buddha. I'm talking about Theravada Buddhism. We cannot do that. I cannot all of a sudden feel like, oh, I think uh, we should adjust to this. Monk should do that. Monk should do that on my own. I cannot do that. The Buddha is not allowed to do that. Okay. So that's why if a man ordained 2,500 years ago, or a man ordained today, or a man ordained in the future 100 years from now, he will follow the same rules. That's why it's continued to last, right? Because no one allowed to change any rules. That's a, that's a good thing about it. But in this case, we can apply that. Uh, if you're in the meeting, you have to prepare, right? Because the growth and the well-being of the group, that's number one. The unity of the group, that's number one. So refraining from introducing any bad ideas or policies in any organization or state. Not omitting any good trends or policy of the past and to abide by all traditional law and rules and policies of the past that have been passed down through the tradition. So a lot of things we can apply to this. Okay? The company that becomes successful, they, they cannot build overnight. It's gone through a lot of hardship, success, failure, success, failure, until they come up with the formula. If we were a part of that company, okay, we should admire, we should respect the wisdom of the past. That people work hard for this. Okay, there may be some drawback. So let's see how can we adjust that. But not just all of a sudden ignore. Okay, ignore uh, the wisdom of the previous generation. Then this is how we preserve the integrity. Okay, the quality of the organization. If the monk keeps changing the rule, then and this is this is it has been. It is happening, okay? That's why after the Buddha passed, Buddhism break up to more than 18 schools. Because people feel like, okay, I think this is what the Buddha means. So let's do this. 
I think the Buddha said we monk should not eat meat. Then if you guys don't eat meat, you come and become my student. If you want to eat meat, you become the student of those teacher. So it's about titi, it's about view, it's about the meaning that you interpret the teaching of the Buddha. Then Buddhism start to break into many school of thought. Okay, and that's happen- happening to you know every religion, religion as well. And number four, this you know, go together, honoring, and respecting elders, and senior citizens, and to obey their order and advice. Right? This is what. This is this one. You respect. You respect the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and you also respect the training, the education. You respect the seniority, Sangha. Represent the teacher, right? We learn Dhamma, we learn from the Sangha. The Sangha learn Dhamma from the Buddha. And now we have people who have a lot of experience in our organization. We have many senior monks, some are in 30 years, some are in 40 years, some are in 50 years. They may not good at technologies, but definitely they're good at Dhamma. So this day we have to uh, find a way to be humble, find a way to uh, respect you know the senior people, seniority, include uh, in both in the spiritual world and the, in the business world as well, because their where you uh, their experience and their knowledge, you know, they are, it's 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 considered priceless. Okay, don't just neglect. If you look down their the the experience of the senior senior people, yeah, and that's considered careless, which may harm ourselves, harm the company, harm the family later on. And the next one. Number five, do not fall under the power of craving arising in them and that leads to rebirth. Okay, you may not uh, right away understand the sentence because this the Buddha gives to the, to the monk, right? There is a word craving which is translate the word tanha. And when you hear the word craving, you think of tanha. When you think of tanha, you think of three tanha right away. Kama tanha, crave to for the same pleasure, pawa tanha, crave to have, crave to be, vipawatana, crave not to have, crave not to be. We, we did learn that already. And that leads to rebirth. And this is the idea of the condition of the tanha. When tanha arrives, and that leads to rebirth. Not only rebirth in the next life, but also rebirth in the new emotion, new phenomena. And the yellow one, the orange one, this is uh, the teaching that gave to the Vesali uh, people. In other words, give to the lay people. Respecting women and not violating their right and according them freedom and autonomy. Okay, so see the Buddha give the respect toward men and women are equal here. Don't if any community that look down women don't treat the women well or equally, you know, there always the conflicts in that communities, as we know. So in these two things, the first thing the Buddha Talk to the monk, right? The monk ordained to realize the bana. The monk ordained to let go craving because craving is the second noble truth, which cause dukkha. Dukkha come from ignorance, come from craving. So if a man cannot resist, cannot endure to the power of craving that arise, and that person cannot make himself happy, and when a man or a monk cannot be happy, he may cause the problem to the sangha, to the community that he lived by as well. Same thing in the uh, in the in the worldly life, right? If people at, attached to craving, attached to greed, never feel enough, always stingy, want to take, don't want to give. That company, that organization, will not last long. They only think of themselves. They don't care about give back to the world, give back to the community, give back to the society. So don't fall under the power of the craving. That's we can apply for both monk and the lay people as well. And again, if uh, the company have male and female staff, so we should find a way to treat them equally as well. And number six, seeing the value and the benefit in living in the wilderness and seclusion. In other uh, places, the text says, to delight in the forest retreat. This clearly for the monk, right? How can the lay people all of a sudden leave everything and find themselves, you know, enjoy living life in the forest. That's quite rare to be happening. And this is for the monks. So the monk ordained, like what? Like I said, the monk ordained for uh, mental development fully. Just eat little, have little thing in life so he can have more time to 
practice meditation and perhaps realize nibbana in this very lifetime. Okay, no delay. So stay in the forest. Give the monk that opportunity. is a conducive place to practice meditation. It's quiet, no noise, less people, less distractions. The, most of the monks in the past, they stay in the forest. After they come back from breakfast, they sat down, uh, eat breakfast, clean the bowl. And all day long, what they did, nothing much, right? There was no book to read, no school to attend, no temple to go. So the monk would practice meditation according to the meditation subject or object that they receive from their teacher or even from the Buddha himself. That's what they do. But for the lay people, I still see that it also benefit. If from time to time you can give yourself a nice retreat, maybe once a year, seven days, ten days, or twice a year, you know, the more the merrier, the more the better. So you can, you know, uh, get out of your life cycle as a business people and come back down to the normal life, the life with minimalism, the life with less Distraction, no phone, no TV, no internet. When was the last time you turned off your phone? The question is, can you? Can you turn off your phone? Most people say, no, I can't. We sleep with it, we eat with it, we go to the toilet with it. And that's how people live these days. If you let go of those things, you know, observe eight precept, you stay in a quiet place, you go to the forest, go to the retreat, you feel something special about the mind. You feel meditation make fast progress when you meditate in such environments. All right? So for the lay people on this orange box, Buddha said, persevering, honoring, and worshipping all the religious location, shrines, monastery, in the village or town, not abandon, but keep keeping active the pre-existing religious activities of the sacred place. Okay, this is what happened in Vesali. People in that capital, they take good care of the monk, take good care, take good care of the temple, take good care of the shrine, anything that related to religious, to the teacher, they do their best to preserve and to, not only to preserve, to protect and to continue. Okay, the ceremony, the teaching, the, the chanting that has been done, you know, from from the previous generation, they want to make sure that it, it can be in good shape and it can it can continue for a, a future generation as well. And that's the seven Aparihaniya Dhamma, okay? So that should be not so difficult for everyone to go back and digest and uh, you, can kind, uh, you can compare the teaching that the Buddha gave to the monk and the teaching that the Buddha gave to the lay people, okay? This one, seven of these, is for the monk. But for the lay people, just the, the last three are different, slightly different, but still uh, both of them, whether you learn the sutra that the Buddha teach the monk it can also benefit you as a lay person as well. But if you are a monk, knowing how the Buddha teaches a lay person can always benefit you as a monk as well. Okay, so this is uh, the idea. That's that's why I put them together. Okay, so now we move on to the second topic today. Let's see if anything at all. Please feel free to type in the chat box. Okay, I will take a look uh, from time to time. Okay, the next one is the seven virtue of a good man. Sapuri Satama. Sapuri sa dhamma, okay. Sapa, sapa means sense, mean good, mean virtuous, okay. Purisa again person. It's a good person. Dhamma for a good person. Dhamma for a true person. Dhamma for a virtuous person. Dhamma for a true man, a good man. There are many terms that use when it comes to the translation from Pali to English. So there are seven of them. Again, there are many teachings like this in the teaching of the Buddha as well. Today, I will present you two of them. So you will see two versions. Okay, start from the first one. This one in Tikanikaya in Sankhiti Sutta, the Buddha said there are seven of them. If someone, have, someone has this quality, they consider a virtuous, a true person, a virtuous person, a good person, a noble person, whatever you want to call it. Start from knowing the Dhamma. Sometimes, they translate to knowing the, the law, the regulation, right? The state law, wherever you live. You must know the law, right? You must know the Dhamma. Uh, in other words, you know the cause. You know the cause. If you do this, what's happening next? If you, do that, if you do that, what will be the result of that action? That's what it means. Knowing the Dhamma. Dhamma has a very broad meaning, right? So knowing the Dhamma can be, can, can be knowing the teaching of the Buddha or knowing the situation or knowing the phenomena. 
when this happen why it happen if it if this happening what happening next that's how a good person or a true person or a noble person can see they not only know the dharma they know the meaning they know the purpose of that dharma they know the consequence when they following or practicing that dharma if you break the law you know there is punishment right if you steal someone's stuff if you not stop at the stop sign there will be the ticket issued to you and you have to pay the fee like this this is the the the, the, the idea so you know the cost you know the effect of that cost and you know yourself know yourself mean you the nature of yourself what kind of person are you are you on time are you procrastinate do you have this much of knowledge to do this kind of job or you just pretend that you know that i think i know but in fact i don't know right there are many people make a fake resume and apply for the job and then they you know, maybe over over qualify to the job so they don't get the job so you must know yourself are you a tough person are you a kind person are you a stingy person because in the situation like this how do you normally do uh, in the monastic training we see all kind of people come to us people from different walks of life from different corner of the world if there are food on the food line many good food not only food there are fruit there are dessert there are snack there are coca cola there are ice cream that the monk can take whatever he like what kind of person you are you can easily tell right every time you go to the food line if you take the food you like you just neglect the food that you don't like or if some day there is no food that you like at all the food that served by the local villagers they just offer you what they have somehow it's not the food that you familiar with what happened in your mind any aversion any agitated how come today there is no pizza today is just sticky rice just keep complaining so you must know yourself this is what it mean and if you think like that what happening next are you going to have a good meditation today what can you do tomorrow this is about about one knowing oneself okay keep observing keep understanding keep adjusting okay moderation again example the same example there's so many good food on the line and the monk eat is off from the bowl right the bowl is deep sometimes you feel like you put just a little but in fact there's so many food in there already and some monk cannot finish the food that they take because is is the food is so good we want everything a little bit of everything and when we, it keep adding up in the bowl and then cannot finish at the end of the eating session so moderation mean you know the difference between needs and wants you know when to stop you know when to take it you know when it's done is done that's called moderation how many stuff you have in your closet that you never been you, you never used them in the past six months but you still keep buying right we still have we always have room for something we like something is on sale just go buy it and find a place to hang to keep it and just keep it there for six months that's not moderation moderation is no yeah you, this this is you need this is you don't need this is enough now i stop no more no no more some of this thing okay and no this is called moderation and knowing the proper time is about time what time for the meeting what time should you go for the meeting what time is the right time for study what time is the right time to go arms round if you go too early then nobody show up and give you the food if you go too late everyone go to work no one's there to give you the food either so you must know the time right the time that's suitable to do things and you know the society basically you know the people you no know assembly people that you live with you are from, even though you from different country you come and become a monk in one monastery you must know that these people come from non buddhist background they may come from the belief from different doctrine now they become a monk they want to learn what the buddha teach and living with people like this you know the trainer or everyone in the training must be very open minded so we must know them well we cannot just force people to believe just take time to explain for them you know giving them information that that suitable not too much not too less so they can understand they can follow and they can put into practice so you we must know the assembly as well we must know the people that we work with you must know your customer you must know 
the company that you're about to sign contract with. That's the idea. And the last one, knowing the individual. Knowing the individual means knowing a person that you live with, a friend that you live with, a customer that you work with. You know, there are all kinds of people in this world. We, we must know them in order for us to be happy and success in life. So this is called the seven virtues of a good man in the first version of this particular sutra. And the second one, a little bit longer, but it's more toward the lay people. Just by looking at the first slide, okay, there are many things on the list already. But you don't have to be panicked because you learn all of this already. This is just number one. There are five of them. This is number one. Number one, the Buddha said, a man who is considered a man without failure, without deterioration, he has faith or satta. He has he re, a moral, moral shame. He has otapa, the moral fear of doing bad things. He has pahusatja. We learned this already, right? Pahusatja means you are a serious study a student. You continue to learn. You acquire more wisdom. And the Viriya, again, today you learn Viriya. Today you see more uh, places that the Buddha talk about Viriya as well after you learn from the Wood. He put forward diligence and effort. Diligence and effort of Viriya. He has uncheckable mindfulness or sati. The mindfulness, mindfulness is always there in most of the Dhamma practice. Okay, That's why I sometimes I ask you, is there anything at all, any Dhamma at all that we can practice without mindfulness factor? Yes or no, right? So think about it. And the last one, he has wisdom or panya. You see the word panya very often. The word panya, the word wisdom, the word sati, the word viriya, they appear many places in the teaching of the Buddha. And they're not just there for no reason. Okay, Sometimes they group in this particular group of Dhamma. Sometimes they appear in different group of Dhamma. There is a reason behind that, that you need to somehow try to figure it out. Right? Your job is to decode what the Buddha means, just like the Buddha is a programmer, he programmed it. But when we come to the code, we need to understand the meaning behind that code. Okay, how far that this code you take us to. Okay, so satha mean what? Satha of faith mean what? In order for a man to realize Nibbana, he must have faith to the teacher, right? Respect the Buddha, respect the Dhamma, respect the Sangha. The Buddha is the one who discovered the Dhamma. The Sangha is the one who study and preserve the teaching of the Buddha. So we have satha that, hey, there is possibility for me, a person like me, to realize Nibbana as well, if I'm following this teaching, because there's so many people back then have achieved this uh, realization of uh, Nibbana or mental liberation. If we don't have faith, then we may not ordain, because we don't see the importance of ordination and becoming a monk. If we don't have faith, maybe we change the career already. And because you have faith, so you become, you work in this field for some reason, has some benefit there. There's some value there. That's why you becoming a monk. That's why you become a teacher. That's why you become a lawyer. And Hiri Otapa, they go together, right? This is the Dhamma that protect the world. We learn from the first week. Protect the world. Hiri Otapa. And when you hear the word Sati, you by default or right away, you should think of the word Sampachanya or the clear comprehension. They are the Dhamma that uh, support all kind of Dhamma in the teaching of the Buddha. So Hindi Otapa go together. We feel this is about precept sila. The prerequisite for precept is Hindi Otapa. You have moral shame of doing bad, moral fear of the consequence of that bad action. Then we don't break precept. Then we don't do anything bad. We don't lie. We don't kill. We don't steal someone's stuff. Okay. And Pao Sacha, okay, it's about acquiring wisdom, right? Continue to learn and make an effort. Don't give up easily. So this is the first uh, group of the qualities of a good man in number one of this particular sutra. And number two, now he consult, he consult. All of this go into the same format, but just different keyword. The first word is called consult. The second word is called thinking. The third one is called saying. The last one is called doing. He consult anyone about anything. He does not do so in ways that do damage to himself or others. He thinks of anything, he does not do so for the purpose of doing damage to himself or others. He say anything, he does not do so for the purpose of doing damage to himself and others. And he does anything, 
he does not do so for the purpose of doing damage to himself or to others. Okay, how can we apply the Noble Eightfold Path in this teaching? What we do, what we say, come from what we think, right? Thinking is important. Before we do things, we think. Before we say things, we think. Sometimes we may feel like, oh, I, I'm just saying, I don't think. But in the mind level, if we have that X-ray eye, we will know. If we have Vipassana eye, know that there is consciousness there. Otherwise, you cannot formulate the word in your head, in your mind, go through your mouth and say the bad thing to others. It's happened very quickly. So thinking first and then saying, doing, follow. What we think, then we do, then we say, right? And so this is called the Samma Thitthi. I'm sorry, Samma Sankapa. Or right, right intention or right thought. This one, Samma Sankapa, right intention. And right intention come after having the right view, right? And this is the right view. He has the right understanding or view. Samma Thitthi. For example, he understands that if you do good, you receive good. If you do evil, you receive evil. This is called samadhiti. If someone who has different view, opposite view like this, he is considered having mitchatiti or wrong view. That uh, there is no consequence. Just kill, just steal, just lie, no problem. There is no consequence of any action. We born one life and then we die and then everything stops. Through the land of Buddhism, this is wrong view. So he has the right understanding. This is right view. With right view, right thinking follow, number three. And then when right thinking follow, the way you say, the way you do, right? The way you consult, this is your action follow after you think good, you will say good, do good automatically. And seven, he gives dana. Okay, this one interesting. Not appear in the Noble Eightfold Path. It appears here. The Buddha suggests the good man, the man who cannot fail, cannot deteriorate, to give. When he gives the dana, he gives with respect. Respect again, right? Respect of the dana. In other words, he has consideration both for the thing which he is giving and for those who receive, okay, the object, okay, and the receiver. He does not act as though he were throwing it away. So he respects the dana, the thing that he gives. There are four ways that a man can get the maximum benefit out of his giving. So in this world, like I said, nothing gets lost, right? You do good, you get good. When you give, you gain. The more you give, the more you gain. You give life, you get life back. You give food, you gain energy. You give clothes, you gain radiant skin. You give the light, you get the eye, the insight. That's mentioned in the text as well. So there are four factors involved. First, the thing that you give has to come from wholesome, way of acquiring those material. You don't just steal someone's money and donate that money to build a temple. That you don't get the maximum merit by doing that. It's come from your work hard. And you have faith, that's why you give, right? And you yourself observe precept. That's number two. And number three, that means the donor is pure. It's pure means you observe precept, whether five precept or eight precept. And number three, your intention also pure, is wholesome. The reason you give because you say you see the benefit of your giving not because you want people to know that you give, not because you want your name on that building, not because you want the amulet. That's not the matter. That's not important. You know wholeheartedly this donation will benefit the temple, will benefit the school, will benefit the students, then you're happy of giving. And the last one, the receiver, if they are pure, that's a bonus. So if all of this in place, you get the maximum benefit out of your giving. Okay, so dana is another thing that the good man should do to accumulate uh, this kind of merit. And it's related to the 10 perfection that you learned in the previous session, right? The 10 perfection start from giving, start from dana. But to me, the more I learn, the more I practice. This word comes to my mind when I hear the word dana. There's a word called let go. Let go. For a man to realize the bana. He must let go everything, right? He's let go family, let go money, let go possession, you know, leave from home to be homelessness. So he start off this spiritual journey by letting go to pursue a perf perfection, to pursue the ultimate happiness or nibbana. But how can we all of a sudden let go the, um, the craving in the mind? I'm talking about the refined form of craving. When you meditate, you crave for more experiences, you crave for 
uh, new experiences. You crave for a better experience than last time. So the mind keep on craving, 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 and this is called lustful mind. The mind at attached to those experience. The mind attached to the experience that someone mentioned that you hear that oh he has that experience. I want that too. We we cannot just all of a sudden let go that kind of feeling if we don't know or don't practice let go something material something tangible first, right? Just give the food, give the clothes, give material thing first. By giving this thing, then the mind will become softer. The mind have more merit. The your view about giving will slowly change better and better, better and better. Eventually, you can give up something more refined. If you never donate a hundred. Dollar, you cannot donate one thousand dollar. If you never donate one thousand dollar, you cannot donate one million dollar, right? So it has to be accumulated. You donate a little, you give, you, know, you let go a little first, and then you start seeing the benefit of giving. Your view has changed, your faith has changed. It strengthens your faith, it strengthens your view, and it's you know when it get to the that level, you ready to give more. And many people don't understand why that man donate one million, why that man donate one billion. Have you met someone who donate one billion? Interesting, right? Why did they do that, and how can he do that? Not only he has the money, he must have faith. He must have the right view to do that too. Okay. Okay, that's the second topic of today about the s a p p u r i s a t a m a There are the virtue of the good man that. Uh, Uh, today I show you the two version, right? The version of the monk, this one, uh, which the lay people can apply as well to know the dharma, uh, to know the meaning and the purpose of the dharma, or knowing the consequence of doing that thing. The dharma can translate to phenomenon or phenomena. Anything that happening is the dharma, and you know what caused it, and you know if you do this, this will happening. What happening if you break precept? You know the consequence. What happening if you? Plan to cheat on your customer. You should know the consequence. And with Hiri Otapa, you will not do it because you know something bad is coming, whether someone know it or not. Okay, and knowing oneself, moderation, knowing the time, knowing the the, the people, and knowing the individual. And this one again, we go through this already. You have faith, satta, Hiri Otapa, p a n g s a j a Keep on learning. v i r i y a or perseverance, continue to pursue what you do, and you have mindfulness, and you have with mindfulness will lead to the panya. Okay, don't worry, we coming back to this very often. The panya, the sati, the v i r i y a the h i r i o t a p a because they always there, you know, incorporate into many form of teaching of the Buddha. So now we come to the last part of today, which is maybe one of the most difficult topic, but we will slowly get to know them. This is the slide that's supposed to be here. Okay, before we get to that, I remember I, I think I mentioned this one time. But again, just recap. Okay, we haven't learned about this topic yet, but we touched some of this. Okay, some of this uh, dhamma of the uh, body p a k i y a dhamma already. There are 37 of them. We did touch on the found the the s a t i p a t h a n a the foundation of mindfulness. We did touch on the i t i p a d a Today you learn again, right? c h a n t a v i d y a c i t t a v i m a n g s a and the indriya, right? The sense factors, the five power we learn already. We have faith or satta. We have effort or v i d y a We have mindfulness or sati. We have concentration or samadhi. We have p a n j a or wisdom. And today we will be learning this one, the p o c h a n g k a There are seven of them, and another one on the list is the eight four path, which we will be learning sometime in the later session. So the poti p a k i y a t a m p a k i y a mean on the side of, on the side of what? On the side of poti. Poti mean knowing knowledge, mean enlighten, mean enlightenment. Okay. So this factor, they are on the side of enlightenment. So you can practice any of this. They go, they drag you toward the same path, the path of achieve enlightenment, the path of being better person, happier person, or wiser person. And in fact, we. Come across the s a m a p a t h a n You may not familiar with the name, but you learn already. Even today, from Long Pi Wara Wood, the s a m a p a t h a n right? The effort to give up the bad thing, to prevent the bad thing from happening, to acquire the good thing, to sustain the good thing that happening. That's called s a m a p a t h a n But all these, they are, they has the detail. Okay, which uh, 
I don't see it in here in the curriculum of the elementary level, but uh, we touch on some of this, you know, from time to time. But just want you to see the big picture first before we start jumping to it. Okay, this one we learned already. The five powers, right? Panchapala. They are one of these 37 items in Potipakya Dhamma. We have faith. Uh, it has faith, it has effort, avriya, it has mindfulness or sati, it has concentration or samadhi, it has panya or wisdom. So you see them again. So you should memorize them by now. And you should know what they mean by now, what it means by sati, what it means by samadhi, what it means by panya, what it means by viriya, what it means by faith, right? Viriya is the right effort. Samma, vayama. Viriya or vayama. I mean effort, right effort, right? Mindfulness is again is samma sati or samma sati or right mindfulness. Concentration or samma samadhi, right? It's right concentration. And they, all two of these, they consider the group of panya. You see, when you study the Four Noble Truth and the Eightfold Path, you see them again. And that's a good news, right, to see them often. But the important thing is you should be able to connect the dot and see how they related in each particular dhamma that they appear. And this is the one that uh, the Buddha mentioned before he get into this particular uh, Dhamma about the factor of enlightenment. He said, these seven factors of enlightenment, he mentioned to Venerable Kasapa, they are well expounded by whom? Me, me and the Buddha. Cultivated and much developed by me. And when cultivated and much developed, they conduce to full realization, perfect wisdom, to Nibbana. Okay, in other words, if someone following these seven factors, just like the Buddha did, it will take that person to Nibbana experience, to experience Nibbana. So that's why that means this teaching is important, right? If you want to know how to realize Nibbana, this is one of the teachings that the Buddha teaches. If you do this, you get there. The growth of the bhikkhu, the growth, the growth, the development, the growth of the bhikkhu is to be expected, not the decline. In other words, if you do this, following this, you only grow, you cannot fail. What are those things? So as long as, as long as they cultivate the seven factors of this enlightenment, namely the mindfulness, or the, the investigation into phenomena, this is another interesting translation for the word Dhamma. Many Buddhist scholars translate phenomena on behalf of the word Dhamma in Pali. Okay, which is make a lot of sense. Dhamma is broad. Something that's happening is phenomena. Is this is the Dhamma. The energy, the vidya, the bliss, the piti, the tranquility, the pasati, the concentration, the samadhi, and the equanimity or the ubeka, the ubeka. There are seven of them on the list that lead to the realization of Nibbana. The pochankha is the term in Pali. Pochankha. Sometimes in Thai we call pochankho. Pochankha has seven uh, comprised of seven factors. The first one, mindfulness or sati. What comes to your mind when you hear the word sati by now? I will get to the meaning in a moment. Second one is called dhamma vichaya. Okay, this may be new. Dhamma vichaya. It's dhamma and vichaya. Vichaya means investigate, okay, scrutinate, scrutinize. Vidya, okay, you hear vidya many times today from the previous session and in my session. Vidya usually translate to effort, right, or energy. And somehow I really like this term, energy. Why Vidya refer to energy? Why people translate like that? Interesting, right? Okay, we get to the explanation in a moment. And the number four is called Piti. The reason we need to know Pali because the Pali will not change. Whether you read today, 500 years ago, or people 500 years from now, when they come to study this teaching, they will not change. It's the same word. Depends on the translator, which vocabulary they've seen fit. But today I will show you places where they translate differently. That's why we need to somehow, it's almost unavoidable when it's come to study Dhamma, to, to, to hear the Pali term and try to understand the meaning from the root, the original vocabulary, which is the Pali, right? Not we cannot rely on English vocabulary or, or some other languages, but we can find many of them as much as possible to, to see if they can give us a better picture to understand that one particular Pali word. Number five is called Pasati. 
ปัสธิปัสธิ mean what mean calms of the things which disturb the mind okay and rapture p i t i usually translate to rapture or joy sometimes deep happiness okay if you read from different translator you see different word this is quite interesting because because it's not easy to explain the meditation experience or any kind of experience any kind of phenomena through the word through human language we have limitation how can you explain how spicy of the chili mexican chili and thai chili can you explain the difference it's just difficult right? it's hot it's it's heat it's burn it's still not that it's still not the real meaning of how spicy of the chili is until you Try the chili yourself. Then the problem s o l v e oh, Okay, this is Thai chili. It's small, super powerful. When you eat, you cry. And this is Mexican chili. It's bigger. It's also hot. When you eat, you cry. But they're not the same. We can call spicy, but they are not the same taste of spiciness. That's why they come up with different terms to help reader to understand the Pali terms. Number six is called samadhi. Okay. Samadhi we hear often, right? Samadhi is not just meditation. Okay, it's deeper than that. And the last one today is Upekha. Upekha is not new to you. You learned the Brahma Vihara already, right? Metta Karuna Mudita Upekha, Metta Loving Kindness, Karuna Compassion, Mudita Sympathetic Joy, and Upekha Equanimity. We learned that already in the Dhamma Group Four. And now they appear here again. It just repeat. It appear from place to place. Throughout the teaching of the Buddha, start from number one, mindfulness. People give a lot of meaning to the word mindfulness, but you have to keep in mind that where did mindfulness come from? Mindfulness come from the Buddhist text, come from Pali, called Sati. So, if we want to know the real meaning of Sati, we need to go check in the Pali dictionary. Somehow, people usually translate to mindfulness, and somehow. Is unclear what it means by mindfulness, and this is the meaning appear in the Abhidhamma, which is to me is I feel direct. It is very clear. So that is with mindfulness, constant mindfulness, recollection, the act of remembering, the bearing in mind. Interesting, the non-forgetfulness and the right mindfulness or samma sati. This is the meaning of sati. Explain in the Abhidhamma. Which one do you like? Which one makes sense to you? How can you apply this? When you see, you can apply into practice right away. That should be the meaning that you should pay attention. The recollection is good, right? You recollect, you remember. Remembering is another good one. Non-forgetful, similar, right? Remember. The reason you remember because you don't forget. And another one, the bearing in mind. This one also interesting. Bearing in mind that you are eating, not watching television. Bearing in mind that you are breathing in. You know that you're breathing in. You know that you're breathing out. You are using the breathing meditation object, not the mantra, not visualization. You with your breath fully. You you remember, I am sitting here meditating, utilizing the breathing technique. I'm gonna keep watching my breath in and out throughout my nose. Breathe in long. I know I breathe in long. Breathe in short. I know I breathe in short. Breathe out long. I know I breathe out long. Breathe out short. Breathe out long. I know I breathe out short and breathe out long. That's bearing in mind. This is the real meaning of the word sati. Okay, so don't get confused. You take this as the standard meaning whenever you hear the word sati for the rest of your dhamma study. Whatever dhamma that you learn, you will see the word sati very often. But come back to this. Come back to this meaning. The recollection. The remembering and the bearing in mind, and sati is not just you remember what you do in this present moment. The deeper meaning of sati, you remember another interesting meaning of sati that you you may know but you may not, you know, aware. You hear the word b u p e n i w a s a n u s a t i y a n a b u p e n i w a s a n u s a t i y a n a The first knowledge, the first higher wisdom that the Buddha attained before he achieved enlightenment. Right? There are three knowledge, three higher. Knowledge or three higher wisdom, right? Bupeni w a s a n u s a t i y a n a j u t u p a p a y a n a and a s a w a k a y a y a n a The first one said, Bupeni w a s a n u s a t i y a n a There is a word, sati, n u s a t i 
And now you see this definition. Sati means what? Sati means the act of remembering. So that means sati can recall the previous life experience. One life, second life, third life, and countless of life in the past. That's what the Buddha can do. So he used sati to recall his previous life experience. That's the power of sati. Okay, it's not just you know what you do at the moment without analyzing it, without making any judgment. It's not just that. You bearing in mind what you do, and this this gonna go along with the rest of the 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 rest of the six factors that we are going to discuss about. But start from having sati first. Second, called the dhamma vichaya, the investigation, the discernment, the judgment of the dhamma. This is called dhamma vichaya. In other words, you when you meditate, right? You are mindful of your breathing. You breathe in and out, breathe in and out. At the moment that your mind slip away, follow some thought, some craving or aversion, the mind like yesterday experience, or the mind feel bad about someone say something to you yesterday. So the mind go after that thought. The moment that the mind about to leave your meditation object, which is your breath, if you can catch that, that means you are mindful. So sati, another one of sati is you can catch that thing in front of you. And then you analyze it, you investigate it. This is called dhamma vichaya, which is similar to the word sampachanya, right? Ability to reflect, ability to investigate. Otherwise, you, you don't know that experience, that phenomena that is happening in front of you. So you must, the mind must be there to investigate. So the application of the discernment to the body-mind phenomena, body relax or not, the mind relax or not, the mind have lust or not, the mind agitate or not, investigate. In order to apply the right effort, you see, what happens if you, the mind likes something and want to go out? What happens if the mind doesn't like something and want to leave the object? You need to apply the right effort right away to bring it back, giving way to the enter the deeper state of meditation, or we can call the jhana, the jhana state. So you're aware of the body, aware of the mind, you're mindful of your meditation technique, you're mindful of the experience that is happening, you investigate fully. Okay, that's called Dhamma Vijaya. That's the second factor to help one, you know, go deeper in meditation all the way up to realization of the bana. And the third one, Vidya. Okay, we hear this word many times. Vidya usually translate as an effort, right? Persistence, perseverance. The energy, this is something that I like to elaborate a little bit okay the determination the elements of initiative so there are many terms that you try to explain the, the word vidya vidya come from another meaning of vidya is brave that's another interesting meaning energy mean when you persevere okay it's come with the sense of joyful perseverance joyful you know effort it's not just effort with a crowded mind effort with agitated mind effort with annoying minds. If you sit and you want, you hope to have a good experience. You make an effort. The mind go out, you bring it back. The mind go out, you bring it back. But you keep complaining. When is going to stop? I make an effort 100 times, but you still keep going out. That's not, an effort. That's not the right effort. Right effort means, you know, you do it in a relaxing way. Understand the nature of the mind. There must be the reason why the mind think too much in this session. So you reflect, oh, okay, maybe I talk too much on the phone, I check email before I meditate. That's why I thought about work keep coming back to me. So you need to develop that sense of observation of the phenomena that happening to you in your meditation. And then you make an effort with a joyful mind, with energetic mind. It's okay the mind go out. I know you go out. I'm going to bring you back. It doesn't matter you go out 100 times, 1,000 times. I'm going to keep bringing you back 100 times, 1,000 times with joyful mind. Go ahead. I'm going to be here waiting for you to go out and I'm going to bring you back, right? And brave means another interesting meaning about Vidya. You mean, it means brave, brave, brave to do good, brave to observe precept, brave to meditate, brave to say no to alcohol, brave to say no to drugs. You persevere to say no, not just one time. You have to be bold to do good, okay? Number four, getting more interesting about the rapture or the word piti. Pali Kopiti. English give many terms that sometimes confuse. We don't know which one is best for the word Piti. But um, commonly you would see the word joy and the word rapture when it comes to Piti. 
what is pity? Pity is rapture. What is rapture? Rapture is joy. What is joy? Joy is a little bit happiness, not just happy. <laughs> okay, but another term that Pali used, there is something called sukha. It's not just dukkha that we learn. Dukkha translates to suffering, right? Which is not the best explanation of the word dukkha. Not the best definition, but uh, be, be familiar with that. It's okay for now. So there is a word dukkha and there is a word sukha, which is happiness. What's the difference between joy and happiness? How can we differentiate? This one is joy. This one is happiness. This one is pity. This one is sukha. As a meditator, who meditate for many years, many hours. How do we know? Now I'm experiencing pity. Now I'm experiencing sukha. The Buddha used these two terms. He did not use rapture. He did not use joy. He did not use the word happiness because he did not speak English. So our job is to understand what it means by pity. This experience is pity. That experience is sukha. Again, I'm also having a hard time to explain, okay? Because it's not easy to explain experience in any language. We will run into the, we will run out of words that try to explain the best describe of this and that experience. So let's using these analogies. If you think of, you know, a guy who get lost in the desert, he's walking far away, long hour, he still no hope, there's no water, no tree, and all of a sudden he was lucky. He finally see an oasis. The moment that he see an oasis from afar, from far away, something green over there, smell the trees, smell the water. There must be the water there. Just by seeing that from afar, that feeling is called pity. But when he get closer and closer, he arrive at that oasis. He start to jump into the water. He start to drink the water. That feeling is called sukha. He feels satisfying. He actually in that that kind of feeling, which is again, is hard to describe, right? What's the difference? But this is this is the idea of the difference between the word pity and the word sukha. Somehow it's appear in the Visuddhimagga. So if you find some other you know um, explanation, okay, you can share with the group as well the difference between pity and sukha because we're gonna come across this term very often. And perhaps some of you may come across this experience, and you don't know what to call it. But the Buddha call it pity. The Buddha call it sukha. And number five, after pity, what happened? The next is pasati. Okay, that's another good word today. Pasati mean what? Pasati usually translate to calmness, tranquility. Okay, beautiful word. Serenity, relaxedness, the tranquility of body and mind. That's called pasati. So the mind, the body become one, become still. Nothing disturb the mind. The mind is ready to go deep into the state of samadhi. Pasati, okay, that's the idea of pasati. Again, it's still hard to describe, right? What's the difference between pasati and samadhi? Now the mind relax, the body relax. Is that samadhi already? This is uh, the the one of the challenges of many of us who come to the teaching of the Buddha to understand. The word that try to describe the experience that the Buddha and the monk in the past they experience this and they come up with this term for us to uh, to be used as the indicator. Okay, when it's come to yourself, have that experience as well. And the number one, uh, the next one is called samadhi. Samadhi is what? Samadhi usually translate to meditation, right? Which is not the best translation. Samadhi. The classic, the meaning, the classic definition of samadhi is the one pointed of mind, the one pointed of mind. There are some other term that use as well, like concentration, like immersion, the collectiveness of mind. That's another good word. The mind become collective. The mind become unifying. Another good one, unification of mind. The question is. What is being unified, or what are being unified? There must be at least two things unified together, right? That's samadhi. The foundation of serenity and the freedom of mind from distraction, hundred percent. The state of mind, being joyful, being rapture, being still, being still. 
no distraction, being focused. But it's the focus without headache, focus with happiness, focus with bliss, focus with rapture, focus with joy. You see, this is the beauty of meditation and the wisdom. Wisdom go hand in hand with happiness. Listen carefully. Wisdom in Buddhism is a wisdom that go hand in hand with happiness. That's why we should study Dhamma, because Dhamma makes us happy. Not, not only the Dhamma that we read from the text, that also helps us to live good life, like precept meditation, you know, giving the dana, forgiveness, that make us happy as well. But also another dimension of Dhamma practice, which is the meditation. When we go in deep in our mind, we feel blissful. We feel peace, we feel calm, we feel relaxed, and we come, we, we, we realize something called wisdom or inner intuition to help us to understand things better, to see things in a different way. That's through the meditation practice. And this is called samadhi. And the last one on the list is called upekha, upekha or equanimity. Upekha represents the balance, mental state characterized by impartialities non-reactivities and serenities. That's called Upekha. And when you study Dhamma, when you hear the word Upekha, another term that I like to mention here, which is relevant, is called Yatha Puta Na Yana Tasana, the knowledge about knowing things as it is. Yatha Puta means as it is. Accept the realities. You accept the reality without craving or aversion. What's the matter of this? What's important of this? You think of like, you know, you were in line, one, there's a chocolate ice cream over there, and your mind is crave for chocolate. You want to have that chocolate. And when you get in line, the guy in front of you take that the last chocolate ice cream right in front of your eye. There's nothing left for you. At the beginning, the mind crave for chocolate. I want it, I want it, I want it. And all of a sudden, you cannot have it because someone took it. Then the mind turned to be turn to aversion, agitated. Why? You know, not for me. Why him? So you keep complaining. But yatha puta na yanasana or the equanimity mean you there is no craving. There's no aversion in whatever phenomena that you are experiencing. Okay. You want chocolate? Okay, maybe I can have some. So I get in line and when it's my turn, the chocolate ice cream run out. It's okay, it's run out. No aversion. I'll take it later. I go to the next ice cream shop. That's the equanimity, you know, in a sense, that the mind doesn't check through the craving, through the aversion. It's the balanced state of mind. The mind feels neutral. Sometimes we can find this term in the Abhidhamma said it's, it's the experience of atukkama sukha. Atukkama sukha means neither happy or unhappy, neither, neither pleasant or unpleasant. Atukkama sukha, the mind becomes equanimity. But equanimity with joy. Neutral with joy, neutral with energetic, not neutral with laziness, neutral with dullness of mind. No. The mind is bright, the mind is pure, the mind is in a perfect state of calmness, accepting the way they are. In your meditation practice, whatever comes out, good experience, bad experience, the mind becomes neutral, accept as it is. Now the mind go out 100 times, accept as it is, it's okay. Go out again. I'm going to welcome it back again. I'm going to make the effort. I'm going to utilize the right effort technique that I learned to welcome the mind back again. Thousand times, no problem. With joyful mind, accept as it is. Because today the mind is conditioned like that. But yesterday the mind was calmer than today. Yesterday experience, that was yesterday experience. But today experience, there's another experience that we have to face, that we are sitting. We have to accept whether aversion come up, whether a craving come up, we just accept the mind, just stay there. The mind is just the mind, with the mind. There's nothing else. This is called Yatha Puttana Yanasana. Okay? And I'm going to show you the importance of all of this that we just learned. Okay? And then you can apply into your meditation technique that the Buddha gave in several places. Today, let's touch on these two sutra that I uh, researched and, and shared with you today. Being joyful, rapture spring up. Being joyful, rapture spring up. When the mind is full of rapture, the body become tranquil. Okay, joyful, rapture, tranquil. When the body is tranquil, they feel bliss. That's number four. And when 
blissful the mind become immersed in samadhi that's number five you see before you get to the state of mind that the mind becomes still the state of samadhi these are the indicator the joy the rapture the tranquil the bliss in other words we can group all of them to the word happiness but there are many layers of happiness happiness can start from i'm okay Okay, I'm content with the hot, cold seat like this, dress like this. I'm okay. That's happiness too, right? But if you're not okay, then you're not happy. But happiness from start from you okay, and then after five minutes, ah, I feel better. I like it. This technique, this temperature, this room, I like it. And it go from there. It's, it's more. You feel more and more content. You feel more and more joyful in your sitting. You don't want to leave the seat. But we don't know what to call that. Each layer of happiness that keep increasing, we just don't know how to invent the vocabulary to explain that particular moment of happiness that we are experiencing. So joy and then rapture spring up, and then tranquility of the body. When the body tranquil, peace and calm, then they feel bliss. They mean both body and mind feel bliss. And when blissful, the mind become immersed in samadhi. That is why if you are not relaxed, you cannot enter the deep state of samadhi. Relax the body, relax the mind. Happy is the foundation. Happiness, joyful mind, is the foundation of having good samadhi or good meditation. Now you see it from your own eye, not from me, but from the Buddha, from the teaching of the Buddha. This one, another detail that I really want to share with you before we finish. Uh, this is the indicator of meditation too, in my view. How do you know you meditate correctly? This is another one that we can use as a framework, as an indicator. The Buddha give the teaching to Ananda. Or the personnel, Ananda is the personnel attendant, the, uh, personnel attendant of the Buddha. The Buddha said one time, the purpose and benefit of wholesome virtuous, or sila, is non-regret. Okay, now you know why you should observe precept, and the precept is the precursor to samadhi. People say, oh, look, can I just meditate? I don't want to observe precept. The answer is very clear. The answer is no. If you want to be success in your meditation, if you want to be happy in life. Precept or sila is the prerequisite. It's the precursor before you can have a good samadhi or meditation. The purpose of and benefit of non-regret is joy. Joy in Thai we call in Pali we call pramod. Okay, pramod. And we don't know what to call pramod in English. So let's use the word joy. The purpose and benefit of joy is piti. Okay, piti. Let's translate to rapture. After joy, you have piti. And the purpose of and and the purpose of I'm sorry the purpose and benefit of rapture is tranquility, which is pasati. You see, they support each other. When the mind is joy, the mind feel rapture. When the mind is rapture, it lead to tranquility. And the purpose and benefit of tranquility is pleasure. Now sukha sometimes translate to happiness. Depend on the translators. You can use happiness here. Just to be coherent, the purpose and benefit of pleasure is concentration or samadhi. Okay, see, we cannot come this far without observing precept. You see the importance of precept. And then the purpose and benefit of concentration is knowledge and vision of things as they really are, which is again yatha puta na ya na thasana. The purpose and benefit of knowledge and vision of things as they really are is Nipita and viraka, or the disenchantment and the dispassion. Wow, interesting. The purpose and benefit of disenchantment or nipita and dispassion or viraka is the knowledge and vision of liberation. This is called vimutti. Thus, ananda, wholesome virtuous behavior, progressively lead to the foremost. Basically, all of this cannot be happen without a man. Be- uh, observing precept or become a virtuous person first, then you go meditate. And and usually in most cases, the Buddha usually don't just teach someone to meditate. You start from something basic. Start from observing precept first. Know what you can do, what you cannot do. Know what you should do, what you should not do. And when the mind is soft and comfortable with that, you know, be a, a, become a virtuous man, an ethical man, then he will start introduce the meditation object to the student. Because if we meditate with a guilty mind, remorse, something we feel bad with our wrong action or wrong doing, then the mind cannot go deep in meditation. Forget about go deep. 
the mind cannot even be still. Every five minutes go out, every one minute go out. It feel guilty. Precept lead to joy. Joy lead to rapture. Rapture lead to tranquility. Tranquility lead to happiness. Happiness lead to the station, uh, the state of samadhi. Okay, of concentration, and that will lead to something higher than that, which is to see things the way they are, the yatha putta and yanasana, and then will lead to this enchant. This enchant, the mind just see no point of clinging on this five aggregate, no point of clinging on that person, that object. It's just feeling bore, bore of attachment. Okay, not bore of meditation. See things the way they are. The five aggregate is un, you know, is ugliness, is loathsomeness. Nobody beautiful, nobody handsome. So the mind turn away from those sense desire, and the mind come back and the mind let go. This enchantment is the higher state of let go. You see, how can you let go of something like this if you never give material thing, right? So start from dana, and then observe sila, and then the bhavana or samadhi later on. They support each other. Then you can let go something big, like let go the defilement, let go the craving, let go the aversion later on. And nipita and viraka, this enchantment leads to this passion, completely nothing to cling on. Nothing is worth clinging on. Human animal object is nothing in this world that worth clinging on. And then it leads to the right liberation, realized nibbana at the end of that meditation journey of a person who start walking down this path. And that's something what we supposed to be covering today. Uh, is any any comment question? Feel free to let me know. Uh, please go back and relearn. Just recap what we learned today. Uh, there are quite a lot of new term and vocabularies. Okay, so we pay respect to the triple gem and we will take a break. <laughs>